we have Praveen with us. Hey, Praveen, welcome to the stream. Hi, hello, everyone. Hey, uh, nice we can hear you clearly. So Praveen will be taking us through the Pythonic Interfaces presentation. And uh, stage is all yours, Praveen. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all uh, having a great time at uh, PyCon India. Uh, and I hope your day one was very interesting and enjoyable. Welcome to day two. So my name is uh, Praveen Shirali. And I'll be talking today uh, on a Pythonic approach to interfaces and interface enforcement. If uh, this is the first time you're exploring the subject, then uh, don't worry. Uh, we'll be discussing concepts from scratch. At the end of this talk, there is a slide which has references and links for uh, further reading. And that should help you dig deeper into the subject. So you can check that out later. Um, so I've been told by the coordinators that there could be a lag between me presenting and you listening. So if we pause for questions in between, that may delay uh, things a little. So in the interest of time, uh, I'll take questions at the end of this talk. Uh, at the bottom right of the screen, you will find slide numbers. And if you have questions uh, which are specific to a slide, then do make note of the slide number. I'm happy to run back through the slides to refer to that. Uh, the slides are also available on the URL listed here at the bottom. So you can refer to the slides independently during Q&A. Uh, if you don't find sufficient time for Q&A, then uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly at some later point. The last slide has information on how to reach me. Right. So with that, uh, let's get started. So yeah. So in this talk, uh, we'll try to understand what really is an interface and why is it important. We'll see what benefits we derive from enforcing interfaces. We'll also explore what options we have in Python 3 and uh, third party libraries to help us with this. Finally, we'll look at a couple of factors to keep in mind when choosing a solution and what are the pros and cons and stuff. OK, so let's get started. So what is an interface? An interface is a shared boundary across which two or more components share information. So do note uh, the terms highlighted. So we'll try to explore this with an example. OK, so consider an application. And that's sort of represented by the box over here. So this application has a class called a uh, data processor, which is responsible for processing some data. Now, this data processor is responsible only for processing the data. And it relies on another component somewhere inside this application to help fetch that data. And somewhere in this application is a class called a file IO class. And this class is capable of reading data from a file and writing data to a file and so on. It does this through the read and write methods, uh, typically found on file-like objects. And the data processor depends on the file IO instance and calls its uh, read and write methods somewhere during its execution. Now, let's say that the application needs to support more such data sources in the future. So consider that there is a class called memio. And this is very similar to the file IO class. It defines exactly the same methods as file IO. They behave in the same manner as well. But the memio class operates entirely in memory. It doesn't read or write from a file on disk. So this gets interesting for the data processor because it has to work with classes which are similar. So you could say that the data processor now requires a class which implements a read and write method. So to put that in context, uh, think of uh, a data processor as a first person. right? So the data processor is advertising to everybody else that uh, I, I can perform read and write operations. And I can work with any class which helps me do that. And what I'm doing is I'm going to call your read and your write method. And for me to do that, I expect that your read and your write methods follow a particular format in the form of uh, the arguments that have to be passed. So if we were to express this relationship in the form of code, we could define a completely new class, uh, 
um, so let's call it read writer because it does read and write and uh, let's define the read and write methods inside it but it's got nothing else there is no implementation whatsoever it is just empty methods now this represents an interface it's an empty class which only defines what methods need to exist and this serves as a blueprint for other classes which actually implement these methods like file io and memio uh, implement these methods now does file io have methods with the same definition as read writer yeah it does right um, so we expect uh, read to read and we expect write to perform a write operation and so on so the, even the behavior uh, is as per the spec so we could say that file io class satisfies the read writer interface mind you we are like uh, doing this this is implicit assumption because we are uh, comparing it by just visual inspection but if we could programmatically verify this then we would say that the file io class implements the read io read the writer interface similarly you can observe that the mem io class also satisfies the read writer interface now if there are future needs for similar io classes could a completely new class implement the interface yeah it could right so all it needs to do is it needs to ensure that the read and write methods are exactly the same or they are implemented in exactly the same form but is it really necessary to have interfaces like why do we have to be so strict could we choose not to be strict like for example this class here is a less strict version of the io class right it defines read and write methods which could work with the data processor but uh, you don't see it matching the interface right but technically it should work but the question really is do you want to take a chance with this because if there are issues you will discover them during execution when those read and write methods actually get called so sure you may have unit tests and stuff but it's like pretty late like you're going to discover them when you run those tests um, and everything depends on that the fact that you've written your tests well and so on but ideally it would be awesome for you to know about these when you're writing the code itself right that's that's a good early stage to know when things are deviating so this leads us to an interesting thought like could we detect and verify interface deviation automatically so that we don't leave this to chance rather can we write code to enforce the fact that the implementations like file io and mem io must implement methods as per spec in this case as defined by read writer interface because if we are able to do that then we can detect missing methods wrong arguments misspelled method names bad declarations and absolutely any deviation that might arise right we don't have to test for such deviation specifically but we just get some code in our application to do that for us so what does interface enforcement mean exactly this right? we basically find some code which ensures that a class adheres to an interface and if it doesn't then the application raises errors so rather than testing for it we make it a requirement for the application for it to start or run correctly and what do we really want to enforce we want the method names to be correct we don't want to miss any methods we want method signatures to match that is the arguments the order of arguments type annotations etc we want it to respect descriptors and decorators like static method property etc if some methods are generators or async methods we should be able to detect those as well and really anything along those lines if you feel that there's uh, some sort of a structure that has to be followed by all of the implementations you could try to enforce it so in summary the expectation is if you have an interface and this interface defines certain methods in a certain format uh, and there are specific arguments specific uh, decorators which define it and so on you want all implementations to implement it in exactly the same way as the interface defines it so why is this really important well clearly there are some benefits but like what problem does it solve in the real world so let's again try to understand this with an example 
consider an application again, again represented by this box, and uh, assume that this application consists of a lot of components. And these components could be modules, classes, functions, and so on. Just code distributed across the application. And all of these components or classes, they talk to each other. The instances talk to each other. And over time, the application is constantly evolving. Some components are getting added. Some components are getting removed. We may improve some of the components as well. We'll have better versions of the same components working in its place. And over time, the application begins to take uh, shape. And at some point, when you introduce a change to a component, we end up breaking the application. Now, one of the reasons could be that the interface between these components are not clearly defined. So one of these components, which could be these uh, empty boxes, makes a call to the component in the green box, expecting that a certain method is available and expecting that it will behave in a certain manner, which it doesn't anymore. So what we ideally want is a scenario where we can plug and play such components or classes right, without worrying about breaking method calls. At least if you're able to ensure that, then uh, that the interfaces are honored, then that's one less problem to worry about. So what really are the benefits? For a start, we get clear boundaries of separation and responsibility for each of the classes. And that makes it easier to maintain applications uh, because they are less prone to errors. If we are able to enforce interfaces, then we could prevent some errors as well. Right? And knowing them very early is a huge win. It saves time, a lot of engineering effort, and also improves quality. So how do we enforce interfaces? So Python has a library called abstract base classes, right? ABC in short. And ABC provides mechanisms to achieve what we discussed to some degree. So interfaces are enforced using meta classes. And interface class sets ABC meta as a meta class. ABC meta is a class inside ABC. Right? And ABC meta uh, actually has the code that does the enforcement. Additionally, we need to decorate each of the methods with this abstract method uh, decorator, indicating that this must be present in the implementation. So an example of what this would look like, uh, in this case, let's look at memio. So memio inherits from read writer, which is the interface. And uh, then we have the read and the write methods actually implemented in this class. And when you try to create an instance of memio, that is when the checks are performed to see whether read and write are implemented or not. So just uh, note this once again, that the interface marks the abstract method. Interface marks those methods which are meant to be mandatory. And the implementation actually implements it. So how does the enforcement kick in? Right? So let's say you have a version of memio which does not have the right method. Right? Now, when you try to create an instance of memio, then the compliance code will kick in and say, uh, your memio class does not implement a right method. So that's the type error that's raised over here. And this error is raised when the instance is created, when you're instantiating the class. Now, there are some limitations to what ABC can do. Uh, you can see uh, an implementation here of memio where the read and write methods have no arguments at all. Right? However, no exceptions are raised when the instance is created. So while abstract base classes can enforce the presence of methods, they can't do anything beyond that. Uh, on the positive side, uh, as the entire mechanism is uh, defined using uh, meta classes and inheritance, uh, the subclasses tend to automatically benefit from the advantage of interfaces which are already defined uh, in the uh, in the interface, the, the implementation tends to benefit from it. But uh, ABC has actually been around since Python 2 when it was designed. And perhaps at that time, the goals were uh, different. Right? Uh, now, there's an interesting talk by Raymond Hettinger on this, which uh, sheds some more light on uh, the ABC's history and so on. So 
Uh, it, the link for that is there in the reference slide, and you can have a look at it later. But uh, Python 3 has evolved a lot. Um, and let's see what we can do with that. So let's explore Python 3, some of the libraries, and what it can offer. So Python 3 has support for type annotations, async, better typing. There is an inspect library, which is part of the standard library. And uh, the inspect library is actually kept up with the times. Besides, Python offers expressive ways of defining APIs. Methods can be defined in a lot of ways. We're going to look at a few of them now. But obviously, there is more that Python can do than what we're covering in this talk. So like, let's look at some ways to define a method, uh, in this case, foo. And uh, while we do so, let's also observe some uh, factors that matter. Yeah. It's likely that any Python 3 application you are writing today will likely have methods defined in all of these forms, or at least a majority of these forms. So, uh, so this stuff is very relevant to Python 3 applications of today. Right? So let's start with the first one. Obviously, the name, is, name of the method is very important. It, it is the identifier with which the methods can be retrieved. And everything else is verified using that as the first step. Next. The method signature is important because they define the arguments, type annotations, etc. Then we have uh, data descriptors um, like the property decorator, setter, etc. These are interesting because though they though the members look like methods, they are not really callable and they behave like attributes. Then we have class method and static method decorators. We also have generator functions, coroutine functions, which lend themselves to different behavior as compared to regular methods. So what can we do with inspect? So inspect has a function called signature. And as the name suggests, this function returns a signature object. And the signature object represents the arguments, their order, type annotations, Basically, everything that follows the method name. And signature objects can be compared against each other. So you can use this easily to verify signatures across an interface and an implementation so that you can know whether an implementation actually implements it correctly or not. Now, again, data descriptors are special. So you have methods which look like they have the same name, but they are decorated with property setters, getters, etc. These are not callable. So inspect.signature will fail on them. But there's a handy function called isDataDescriptor, which can tell you whether a method is a descriptor or not. And you can use that as a mechanism to further fetch the actual getters and setters, and things like that. There are also functions which can detect generator functions and coroutine functions as well. So there's isGenerator function, isCoroutine function. It's pretty straightforward. This is a little interesting. So the class methods and static methods can be detected first by fetching the method from the class that actually implements it. And we can do this by navigating the classes, MRO. Uh, the MRO stands for uh, method resolution order. And the, the dunder MRO attribute holds the entire class hierarchy. So once we fetch, we can then use ease instance to check whether uh, a method is a class method or static method. And the reason you need to do this is because uh, the methods could also be inherited by an implementation. Though the, though the inherited class does not define it, uh, it's likely that the parent defines it and the decorator is actually used in the parent class. So that's why we need this uh, method to fetch the actual uh, class where that method is implemented and then check on it. So like, let's revisit our list. Right? So if you look at the method definition list here, we have a way to identify everything that's on the list. So it's pretty easy to build enforcement capabilities. So if an implementation does not satisfy a check, just raise an error. And that's enforcement. Yeah. Hello, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But uh, the attendees are saying that the slides are not getting changed. Are you on the same slide, slide number 49? Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I could see that. 
Oh, um, I'm sorry. Let me just run through the slides again. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks for pointing this out. Um, right. So uh, I'll just take one minute to quickly run through the slides that I explained. Um, sorry for the miss. So we were looking at this slide with where all the methods were defined and uh, like various methods, way, ways in which you can define these methods and what we can do with inspect. Right? So the first uh, function we saw is inspect.signature, which can be used to uh, retrieve a signature object. These signature objects are actually comparable. So you can use this to verify whether uh, a defined signature from an interface matches that of an implementation. For property decorators and data descriptors, there are some special uh, mechanisms in place. So basically, the method names look the same, but they're actually decorated. So the inspector signature does not work because these methods are not callable. But there is a function called is data descriptor. So you can use that to detect whether a, a method is a data descriptor or not. And if it is, then you can start fetching specific elements from it. For generator and coroutine functions, there are again ready functions, uh, which you can just call. For class method and static method, you need to go through a route to actually fetch the method from the class which implements it, and then check whether a class method or a static method decorator has been applied on it or not. So uh, coming back, the types of method definitions that we originally listed, we feel that there is a, there's a way to actually uh, verify all of these and build an enforcement mechanism to detect these and also raise errors. So in fact, there are some third party libraries which already do this pretty well. Uh, so so th there are more than these libraries. So I'm just listing three of them here. Uh, implements, Python interfaces, and zope.interface. Uh, implements is a very simple uh, library which does a lot of enforcement. Basically, it's just one decorator that you need to import and use on your implementation. Python interfaces uh, has wider support for Python 2 and Python 3. It uses meta classes. And zope.interfaces is a huge package. Uh, it's got very descriptive APIs and so on. So how do you choose a solution that matches your needs? So there are a bunch of factors which are of importance. Uh, so let's do some very quick comparison of just some of the main factors. There are a lot more. Uh, so one of the main ones is composition versus inheritance. And uh, this is very evident from the way you bind the interface with the implementation. So in case of implements, you have your uh, class, which is your implementation, in this case, my class. And you just put a decorator on top of it that says implements, and then pass it the class name, which is actually the interface. So it's that simple. So the class. You can, when you look at the class, you straight away know what interface it implements. So this is a very clean wrapper. It is very explicit. Uh, you can read it very easily. Now, on the right side, both ABC and Python interface packages use meta classes for en enforcement. And the, in, the inheritance is used to propagate enforcement. This is not as explicit as the decorator based approach because you need to know the entire uh, class hierarchy. But on a positive side, because of inheritance, all these subclasses also uh, enjoy the benefit of uh, the interface enforcement. So if you already have a code base which uses inheritance heavily, or you've already been using ABC to do enforcement uh, of interfaces, then uh, Python interface is a great choice to uh, work as a replacement. Another important factor is uh, early versus late enforcement. Uh, which is actually the main advantage that you can draw out of it. Uh, so implements and Python interface, uh, they, they enforce on import or class creation. So as soon as your application runs, when all your packages are getting you know imported, that is when this kicks in. So it is really, really early. And it can stop your application right there in case some errors are found. Right? And this is really useful. Uh, on the other hand, with ABC, 
uh, it is based on the philosophy that the right time to check uh, for any sort of uh, enforcement or adherence is just before when just before the creation of the instance um yeah but however i feel uh, knowing things early uh, pays great dividends so th so you can make a trade off uh, over here i'm sorry i, I didn't advance the slide so um yeah so early versus late enforcement uh, is like this so i think we are at the end of my talk so let's just do a recap um so we defined uh, interfaces what those are and we've seen that interfaces help and uh, uh, interface enforcement even better we've seen on offer uh, what python 3 can provide and what some third party libraries can provide um and really in today's world with python 3 there's really no need for using abc anymore uh, there are much better alternatives we can see how inspect can be used and how enforcement can help us find interface errors early. And uh, with that, we are at the end of this talk. So here are some references for future reading. Uh, the links are, the slides are shared so you can uh, actually go through these at a later point. So thanks a lot. Um, these are ways in which you can reach me if you have any questions at a later time. All the slides are also available uh, online on GitHub for you to refer to. So I'm open to questions now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Praveen. That was great. Now uh, let me just quickly go through the attendees and what they are saying. And uh, let's start from the beginning. When you were almost midway through the slides, um, Shridhar says we can have a adapter for data input for data processor, uh, adapter design pattern. Right. Um, is, is that the question? Uh, no, he's just a uh, comment. He's trying to suggest that particular option. Right. Abhinav yeah. says, um, it looks similar to a J Java interface. I think this is when you were uh, before slide number 49. And uh, right. Yeah, and uh, we have a fairly big question. Okay, so Priyashe says, what's the link for slides on GitHub? So um, for all the attendees, after the session is over, if you want to have a conversation with the speaker, feel free to visit Zulip and go to 2020 forward slash stage forward slash Delhi. And there you can find Praveen. You can ask any question you want offline as well. Praveen will also share all the resources that he wants to share, the code base, the slides, and everything there only. Okay. And we have uh, a big question. Uh, Sairam says the advantage of developing in Python. Let me just quickly copy this and paste just a banner so that everybody else can see it. Okay. Um, so how much time do we really uh, have left for q and So I guess we have a couple of minutes left. Then there is a five minute buffer. So we have, if you see the max amount of time, we have seven minutes. So if someone else wants to ask a question, feel free to write there. So the question goes, uh, let me just. Uh, can, I, can I take the first question? Can I take them in order? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. So on the first question, yes, the adapter pattern helps. The adapter pattern is a way of bridging uh, two different uh, classes on what they offer, and the adapter fits in, fits in somewhere in between and translates what one class requires and how a different class can, you know, offer it. Uh, ideally, that that comes at a fairly advanced stage where you want to, where you are at a situation where you don't have the flexibility of modifying a class because let's say it is being offered by a third party package and you you can't really modify it. So you build an adapter so that you can bridge the connection between these two. Uh, however, the interface mechanism is there for you to establish a common language for two classes to talk to each other. So it is different from the adapter pattern uh, in that it is, it is trying to just formulate rules saying, I am a dependent class, uh, say I am data processor, and I need to depend on class number A, class A, class B, class C. And in order for these classes to give me what I want, I'm going to define this interface, which they are supposed to uh, obey. Uh, and, and if they're, they are compliant, then I can work with them. The, so the purpose is slightly different, though that you can use either of these two to accomplish your need. Um, 
So can we move to the next question? Yeah, let me just comment like it looks yeah. similar to Java interface. Yeah, it does look similar to the Java interfaces where you have it clearly defined and so on. Uh, so it, it's a bridge between Java interfaces and sort of what Go tries to accomplish, Golang. Uh, but it's yeah, we're not get we are not there yet. This this is a fairly Pythonic way of trying to draw similar benefits from what other languages already implement. And, and it's actually part of their language as well. So for us it's it's something we have to build on. Um, another question is, I understand that Python interfaces and, sorry, that's right. uh, the yeah. implements use. Yeah, yeah. So implements is uh, just uses a decorator called implement, right? And what implements does is when you, when you give it an implement, uh, when you give it an interface class, it goes through all the methods that it has. It fetches all of them and understands its signature, understands whether there's a, a decorator on it and so on. And then it tries to compare that with the implementation and see whether the implementation has it or not. So the moment, so all of that logic is built into that uh, interface uh, decorator, uh, sorry, the implementation decorator. So the moment that decorator kicks in, it's going to do that comparison for you on import. So the 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 enforcement is done right there when you are like loading the, um, loading all of the modules. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, I can dig to more details later. It's uh, there's another question. It's situational, but given that both methods are yeah. applicable. So, yeah. If you're writing fresh code today uh, and you have a complete choice of whether you want to do a lot of inheritance or not, uh, then uh, composition is a better way to go about it. But if you're dealing with a huge legacy code base where you're doing a lot of inheritance already, or you're already using uh, ABCs and you want to just transition that code to uh, work with interfaces better then uh, maybe python interfaces or yeah python interfaces or zoop or one of these could be a better choice it depends on what what change you want how early you would like to detect changes and so on so it's just trade offs and how much effort that goes into picking one of the methods okay the, uh, another question is too long so it might cut off on the screen i'm just going to read it from the uh, chat you oh, want yeah. Yeah. sorry Yeah, so uh, the trade off here is uh, how clearly do you know the requirements for one class to depend on another class? So when you say fast development, uh, the, the the methodology uh, matters here. Like, are you are you writing code to then uh, understand how classes work? Or do you have a predefined understanding of how the classes are supposed to talk to each other? So if you already have some predefined understanding of how class A should talk to class B, then you will be able to define interfaces better. Sometimes these interfaces also come out of evolution of a of development as well. So I don't think it slows down the development process that much uh, because the the work involved in getting the in interface in place is not much. You just have to define the methods clearly as a class and then all the classes which are supposed to implement it, you just decorate it or insert it in some way. So the effort required to integrate is not much, uh, but the thought that goes into exactly defining the interface, that is much higher. So yeah, that's where the trade-off lies. Uh, there is a second part of this question. What are the scenarios where interfaces might, must be enforced and where to relax? Um, interfaces give really good value if you have uh, one class which is going to talk to multiple variants of other classes. Like we saw this data processor, right? And data processor talking to file IO, mem IO. Let's say there are like four or five other such classes and you want to enforce rules on multiple such classes. So in such cases, interfaces work really well. Ideally, you should be trying to use this everywhere. Uh, but uh, there may be some places where uh, the API itself is very experimental. You are not sure whether the method definitions you have defined today are the right ones or not. And for you to make changes, it may require you to make a lot of changes all over the place. So in those cases, you may want to relax so that you have solidified the interfaces to a certain degree where you feel that things are stable and then enforce it. Great. Thanks a lot, Praveen. And uh, I hope you had to um, Zulip chat for more questions. And to all the attendees, feel, feel free to reach out to Praveen if you have more questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you all. Have a good day.